you got three opportunities to solve a problem. Number one is when you first think of it. Number two is when you first detect it. And number three is when it actually happens. What would you suspect is the best time to solve a problem? <laughs> one, right? Before it happens. How do we solve problems before they happen when we first think of them? How do we do that? The point that I'm trying to make is all of us know intuitively what we're supposed to do. We know we want to anticipate the problems. We know we're going to brainstorm all the possible problems so we can anticipate them. We'll take a systems approach to do that. We'll do all of those things. But few of us have got a sustainable, repeatable process to do that. And that's what I'm going to show you right now. We're going to take a look at a tool that I call the Decision Support Matrix. In the left-hand column, we want to look at the project that we're working on. We want to list all of the tasks in our project, every single one of them. Then for each of those tasks, we will now brainstorm all the possible problems that we could have. What could go wrong? Once we've identified all the possible problems, then we want to find the first indication of the problem. What is the first smallest clue of the very beginnings of that problem? So when I see this indicator, that tells me this problem is just starting to happen and this is what I'm going to do about it. And now we give specific instructions to the team on what they need to do. Now if we go through this process, are we doing one, two, or three? Actually we're doing number two because we're waiting until we first detect it with the indicator. We want to do number one, right? Before it happens, because here we're reacting to this stimulus. We want to be proactive, not reactive. How do we do number one? Well, first we have to go through this exercise to identify all the problems. Then as we go through that, we're going to say, can we prevent this problem? And if we can prevent it, what steps do we need to take to prevent it? So we find these preventive measures. We now then go back into our plan, incorporate these preventive measures in the plan, and now we can cross this off the list. Now I know I'm talking about this in the execution phase of our instruction, but this is really a planning phase activity. So we're going to develop our basic plan, then we build the matrix to identify all the possible problems we could run into, the problems that we can prevent, we then come up with the preventive measures, modify our plan, cross them off the list. The problems we cannot prevent, or we've chosen not to prevent, then we have our first indicator and our immediate corrective action. So we'll nip it in the bud as soon as it starts. Why would we choose not to prevent a preventable problem? Cost. It may cost more to prevent it than it would be to fix it. So we accept some risk from the standpoint of cost. We choose not to prevent it, but we've got our first indicator. So as soon as it shows up on the scene, we can nip it in the bud and at less cost, apply the immediate corrective action. What's another reason we might choose not to prevent it? How about the likelihood of it occurring is already so remote. And if even we don't do anything, it still might not happen. Now, some of this could be a simple verbal dialogue, like the football coach with his X's and O's. When you see this, that means that's going wrong. Here's what you're going to do about it. And they could just walk through it. And that might work for most things. But for some things that are an immediate action, you know, worker falls from a height, down power line, heart attack, gas line break, where we need to respond immediately. So we need to maybe do a rehearsal. Now, it could be a reduced distance, slow walkthrough. Or if it's a true emergency action, it might need to be a real-time, real-distance, full-force rehearsal. Now, the best example of this happened on September 11, 2001. Morgan Stanley Dean Wood of the investment company, on the morning of the attack, had 2,700 employees in Tower 2 of the World Trade Center. All those 2,700 employees, how many do you think got out alive? 
Out of 2,700 employees, all but six of them got out of that building alive. Now, there's several things they have. One, the airplane hit above them. That was a big help right from the beginning. But more importantly, back in 1993, prior to the 93 attack on the World Trade Center, Morgan Stanley hired a gentleman named Rick Ruscola as their vice president of safety and security. Ruscola comes on board, and he's going through all the Morgan Stanley properties, and he's doing a threat assessment. He has a colleague of his from Florida who is a security consultant that specialized in physical security. They get down in the parking garage, the guy goes, yeah, this is it. If they're going to get you, this is where it's going to happen. Well, about a month later, a terrorist drove into the parking garage of the World Trade Center with a van loaded full of explosives. Riscola gets on the phone, calls his friend back up, says, get your butt back up over here, what are they going to do next? So they're sitting down after the 93 attack, reassessing their initial assessment. And in 1993, they made the statement, next time they're going to hit us from the air. Ruscola is saying, I can't defend against that. I have no control and over influence over the airspace near the World Trade Center. There's nothing I can do to prevent attack of that nature. So he came up with a plan to evacuate the building. And four times a year, once a quarter, full force, real time, real distance, dress rehearsal, they had plan A, B, C, D, and E. And four times a year they practiced it. So on the morning of September 11th when the attack occurred, and members of the Port Authority are saying, be calm, stay where you're at, we got things under control, don't panic. Riscola and his security staff were literally standing on desktops with bullhorns going, everybody out of the building, move to the nearest exit, go to the nearest stairwell, execute the plan, go, 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 execute the plan, move to the nearest stairwell, everybody out now, go. And they all got out, except for Scola and five of the security personnel who continued to re-enter the building to make sure the people were clear and were in Tower 2 when it collapsed. And Morgan Stanley was operational in those redundant facilities within 24 hours after the attack. Now that's a very extremely dramatic example, I understand that. But this is precisely the kind of result you can get from going through something like this. Now how many of you on the project you're currently working on, or are going to be working on, are going to list every single task in the project and go through this drill? Who's going to do that? Not seeing all the hands going up in the room. <laughs> well, if you've got a project of 30, 40 tasks, that's a no-brainer. Of course I'm going to do this. But if you've got a project with 800 to 1,000 tasks, you're not going to get a return on your investment from this. Because even if you only have four problems per task, you're now looking at 4,000 problems that you've got to go through this drill on, and it's just not going to be to your benefit. So what do you do? Reduce this effort to critical and high-risk tasks. If you reduce the list of tasks to those tasks that reside on the critical path, you've now reduced this effort down to a quarter to a third of all the tasks you've got to work on. Now this is a manageable size. Now you're going to get a return on your investment. And the critical path is time sensitive. We don't want problems on the critical path. Problems we have on the critical path we want to solve quickly and get on with them and that'll be worth your while.